What does this airplane have in common with this airplane and this one? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. Today, we're going to be looking at the Boeing B-47 Stratojet. Boeing's chief test pilot in the 1950s referred to the B-47 as one of the most significant airplanes in the world. It first flew on December 17, 1947, the 44th anniversary of the Wright brothers' flight. More than 2,000 B-47s were built, and it was America's first swept-wing jet bomber. That airplane led to the model 367-80, which was called the Boeing Jet Transport Prototype. And you can see the design, the design lineage of the potted engines and the 35 degree swept back wing, the swept back tailplanes. In this case, there was a passenger fuselage or a cargo uh, fuselage, which led to a, a whole family of airplanes. But on the commercial side for Boeing, it was the 707 airliner, the 747 in 1970, world's first jumbo jet, and then the uh, modern age uh, 787 Dreamliner uh, built out of composite structure. And uh, again, the, uh, the entire family of Boeing jet airliners really evolved from the B-47. Uh, it wasn't just Boeing also, it was uh, the design influenced other manufacturers uh, like the Douglas DC-8 that we see here and even other countries with the Airbus consortium building all of their airplanes using swept wings and potted engines. It's uh, unbelievable when you think that the B-47 flew in December of 1947 and just six months earlier, the B-50 made its first flight. This was Boeing's ultimate evolution of the uh, World War II era B-29, uh, fitted with more powerful engines, taller tail, uh, had just more uh, capability all the way around. But this was only six months earlier than the B-47. And what's even more unbelievable, it was less than 20 years from this airplane to this airplane. A six engine, triple sonic strategic bomber, the XB-70. The gentleman you see on the left is Colonel Joe Cotton, Chief Air Force Project Pilot for the B-70, uh, seen here with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fitz Fulton. Joe Cotton flew B-17s in World War II and was one of the first Air Force test pilots to fly the B-47. He had an interesting take on the airplane. He said that all the bomber pilots referred to it as the bomber pilot's shooting star. What that meant was that the airplane handled like a fighter, the P-80 shooting star of that era. And when you look at the evolution of the jet bomber, you understand how revolutionary the B-47 really was. America's first jet-powered bomber airframe was the Douglas B-43 itself, an adaptation of the uh, XB-42 Mixmaster uh, propeller-powered uh, uh, bomber aircraft. Uh, strictly experimental, never uh, went into service. But the first operational jet bomber for the Air Force was North American's B-45 Tornado, uh, a very capable airplane, but again, straight wings and uh, aerodynamically not as clean uh, as the B-47. And so uh, it was a step up from this airframe. But in the mid 1940s, uh, the Air Force put out requ uh, request for a proposal for three experimental jet bombers uh, to see which one would become uh, the Strategic Air Command's new backbone of the fleet. We see here the consolidated Vultee or Convair XB-46, a sleek airplane, but again, straight wing, and uh, the engine uh, nacelle is uh, not the most elegant. Uh, and then Martin's XB-48, which I think is a good illustration, with all due respect, of the uh, aerodynamic phrasing, if it looks right, it flies right. And then you have Boeing's XB-47. And this was the game changer. Again, 35 degrees swept back wing uh, using data uh, from uh, German aerodynamicists in World War II. Uh, you can see just ahead of the national insignia, uh, the ports for the JATO assist. They were integral 
rocket bottles that uh, help the airplane uh, for takeoff, and six potted General Electric J-47 turbojets, each producing 7,200 pounds of thrust. The airplane was capable of uh, being refueled in flight, which uh, was another revolutionary change in terms of uh, extending the airplane's uh, operational uh, combat range of 2,000 miles, uh, giving it near global capability. The airplane weighed 220,000 pounds at takeoff, uh, fully loaded with payload, which is about the same as a Boeing 757 airliner. Here's a nice view of the uh, B-47 pulling into position. This is the pre-contact position behind a KC-97. And here it is on the boom, uh, receiving fuel. And again, this extended the range of the B-47 to uh, full intercontinental uh, capability. The pilot and co-pilot sat in tandem cockpits uh, up on top of the airplane, and the navigator bombardier was in the nose. I'd mentioned the JADO system. Uh, these are rocket bottles that are affixed to the uh, aft fuselage, and they uh, augment the takeoff thrust of the uh, J-47s. And what we see here in this uh, color photo taken at Edwards Air Force Base is uh, the JADO units mounted externally uh, and attached to the aft fuselage on what they call a horse collar. And the purpose of this is that after the takeoff, when the uh, bottles were expended, uh, that entire assembly would drop away. And that meant that the bomber didn't have to carry that extra weight uh, for the rest of its mission. Let's take a trip to Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas. We're gonna take a look at a, a B-47B that was used as a training aid for the mechanics uh, at, the, uh, at the Air Force Base. And this uh, walk around is gonna give you a really good idea of how clean uh, aerodynamically this uh, B-47 really was. Uh, well ahead of its time in 1947. Uh, they always talked about the mechanics having to wear uh, special shoes to go up on top of the wings so as not to scratch the uh, surface. And uh, again, this was a pioneering breakthrough in uh, metallurgy and uh, large aerodynamic structure um, and uh, manufacturing methodology. This view is taken looking down from the roof of the hangar. And again, you can see the clean lines of the airplane. The Strategic Air Command took delivery of the B-47 in 1951, and the airplane served with SAC all the way through uh, the mid to late 70s uh, with the EB-47 uh, recon and ELINT uh, electronic intercept aircraft. The most produced of the uh, type is the RB-47E seen here. It has a longer nose. It's fitted with uh, photo recon equipment uh, and uh, was the Air Force's first high-speed photo recon aircraft. Uh, what was interesting is that that mission evolved from this airplane, the Republic XR-12 Rainbow. This was uh, an experimental aircraft, first flew in 1946, well ahead of its time. It was the world's fastest four-engine piston-powered airplane with a top speed of 462 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. As impressive as that may have been, uh, it paled by comparison to the B-47's 607-mile-an-hour top speed, and that meant it was vulnerable to the new jet fighters that were uh, coming up uh, in the world at that time. But the, uh, the special part of the rainbow was the fact that it carried all its equipment on board. It even had a dark room that you can see up there at the top of the photo uh, to process the film before the airplane even landed. But it had a uh, suite of different types of cameras, lenses, focal lengths, uh, and a uh, camera operator sat in the center of the airplane. Uh, and it was uh, just a revolutionary concept for its time. Here we see a close up of the trimetragon units. Uh, these are Fairchild uh, interchangeable K-17s, K-22 type cameras. And uh, again, they shot uh, oblique or uh, direct downward uh, images uh, at a very high altitude. So in fitting this uh, suite to the B-47, uh, they made some aerodynamic changes, specifically the bomb bay. If you look at this close up, you can see the change. Uh, the sides of the airplane are flatter and the bomb bay would contain cameras, photo flash units for nighttime photography, 
And then uh, the mission was expanded uh, to include three electronic intercept operators sitting in a pressurized pod inside the bomb bay for uh, intelligence missions. As far as the bomber role, the B-47 replaced this airplane, the B-36 Peacekeeper. And uh, it was uh, a revolutionary airplane in its own right. Uh, six uh, uh, Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines uh, in pusher configuration, augmented by uh, four General Electric J-47s. But to get the maximum performance out of the B-47, Strategic Air Command turned to uh, fighter pilots, specifically uh, the F-86 Sabre, the D model as you see here. And uh, in this uh, schematic diagram shown with an F-84 Thunderstreak, uh, you see the toss bomb maneuver. The, uh, it was called LABS, Low Altitude Bombing System. Uh, the airplane would come in at low level, uh, pull up into a loop, uh, release the bomb, and the bomb would have its own trajectory uh, which would take it to the target, hopefully uh, well after the airplane had uh, egressed the area. Well, that's great for a fighter. What does it look like with a bomber? It looks like that. The B-47 would pull up into a loop and uh, release the bomb, and then at the top of the loop, it would uh, roll off and uh, make a 180 degree exit of the target area, uh, hopefully safely before the bomb uh, was detonated. Here's a close up, and you can see the bomb bay doors open and the bomb being released. Well, no mention of the B-47 would be complete without talking about the fantastic movie from 1955 starring Jimmy Stewart and June Allison called Strategic Air Command. Uh, it's available on DVD. Uh, you might find some great uh, clips on YouTube, uh, but uh, if you're into this <laughs> subject and you like the airplane, you gotta see this movie. It's a story of Jimmy Stewart as a uh, Air Force Reserve pilot uh, brought back after uh, World War II, uh, brought into the Strategic Air Command and transitioning from the B-36 that you see here in the background. Uh, he's telling his wife, uh, June Allison, the perfect Air Force wife in all these movies, that he's just going to make one takeoff and one landing. And they wind up going to Alaska in between. Here he is with his B-47 crew uh, being taken out to the airplane uh, in the classic uh, blue Ford pickup. And this is a scene in the movie where they're going to deploy from MacDill Air Force Base in Florida nonstop using in-flight refueling all the way to Tokyo in Japan, Yokota Air Base in Japan. And, uh, well, are they going to make it? They're going to encounter weather and all sorts of other problems. You have to see the movie to find out. But here's Jimmy in the cockpit. In my estimation, there was no one who ever played a pilot better in any movie than Jimmy Stewart. God bless him. But the famous line is uh, things were kind of uh, going, uh, going south uh, toward the end of the movie where he's trying to get in in the weather. And uh, the famous line is, uh, more power, Leo, a little more power. Well, there you have it. A look at the uh, Boeing B-47 Stratojet, one of the most significant airplanes in aviation history and its impact on jet airliners to this day. Thank you so much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. The images that you see here are courtesy of the Wings and Air Power Historical Archive. If you enjoy the program and like the channel, feel free to subscribe. Go ahead and hit that 707 at lower right. We'd love to have you on board. Until next time, take care.